This video is about limits of functions of several variables. Recall limits from Calculus 1. Informally, we say that the limit as x goes to a of f of x is l if the y values, that is the f of x values, get closer and closer to the same number l when x approaches a from either the left side or the right. Please pause the video for a moment and decide if the limit exists as x goes to 0 for each of these four functions. The limit does not exist for this function because there's no single number that the y values settle to. Instead, they wildly oscillate in between all numbers between 1 and negative 1 as x goes to 0. In this second picture, the limit doesn't exist either, at least not as a finite number. Since the y values increase without bound as x goes to 0, there's no finite number that these y values get closer and closer to. In this case, sometimes people say that the limit is infinity, but in any case, it doesn't exist as a finite number. In this third example, the limit does not exist because as we approach 0 from the left, the y values are equal to, and so approach negative 1, but as we approach 0 from the right, the y values are equal to 1. So the limits don't match, and therefore the limit doesn't exist. In this last case, the limit does exist. The limit as x goes to 0 of f of x is 0, because as the x values approach 0 from both the right side and the left side, the y values are heading towards 0 also. The issues that come up with limits in Calculus 1, things like limits going to infinity or limits being different when we approach 0 from different sides, these same issues can come up when we look at the limits of functions of several variables. For a function of two variables, informally, we say that the limit as the point xy approaches ab of f of xy is the number l if the z values, denoted by f of xy, approach the number l as xy approaches ab along any path whatsoever. So looking at the xy plane, we might have the point ab right here. There are lots of ways to approach that point AB. We could approach it from this direction or from that direction, or we could spiral around and approach it like that. And no matter what we do, the Z values should be approaching that same number L. This is an informal definition. You'll see a more formal epsilon delta definition of limit in the book and in class. Sometimes it's possible to get an intuition about whether a limit exists by looking at the graph of the function. For each of these functions, try to decide if the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of f of xy exists. The graph can help you decide, and the color on the graph is based on the height. So large z values are colored red, and smaller z values are colored blue. The green color is somewhere in between. For some of these functions, the function's value itself doesn't exist when x is 0 and y is 0. And that's why the graph turns out looking like it has a hole in it. Once you've thought about which functions have limits and which don't, please continue with the video and we'll go through each of these cases one at a time. For this function, my intuition tells me that the limit does not exist as xy goes to 0, 0. The reason is that the function is very high along the x-axis, but very low along the y-axis. So if I approach 0, 0 first along the x-axis and then along the y-axis, I'll be getting two different numbers for limits. Let's work this out mathematically. If I approach along the x-axis, then y is always 0. So I'll approach along points of the form t0, where t is going to 0. In other words, I'll be looking at the limit as t goes to 0 of t squared minus 0 squared over t squared plus 0 squared. I get this just by plugging in t for x and 0 for y in the expression for f. Now t squared over t squared is just 1, so the limit along the x-axis is 1. 
If I do the same sort of computation along the y-axis, that's where x is 0, I'm going to be approaching along points of the form 0t, where t is going to 0. In other words, I'll be looking at the limit as t goes to 0 of 0 squared minus t squared over 0 squared plus t squared. This simplifies to the limit of negative 1, which is negative 1. Since the limits are not the same as I approach on these two different paths, I know that the limit as xy goes to 0, 0 of my function does not exist. In this second example, my intuition tells me that the limit does exist. No matter what path I use in the xy plane to approach 0, 0, it looks like my z values are going to be going to the same value. Mathematically, we can evaluate this limit just by plugging in 0 for x and 0 for y. The justification for doing this is that we're really applying limit loss. Since the limit of my quotient is the quotient of limits, provided that the denominator is not limiting to 0, and the limit of sums is the sum of limits, and so on. Just like in Calculus 1, the limit laws allow us to break up our complicated limit into the limit of its pieces, which can then be simply evaluated by plugging in the x and y values. An alternative justification for why it's okay to plug in the numbers 0, 0 for x, y and stop there is because this function here is, is continuous at 0, 0 as it's a quotient of continuous functions where the denominator is not zero. And anytime you have a continuous function, you can just evaluate a limit by plugging in values. Mathematical justification aside, as a good rule of thumb, it's always a good idea to start evaluating limits just by plugging in values. And if nothing goes wrong, you can stop there. On this next example, however, we can't get away with just plugging in 0, 0 for x, y in order to evaluate the limit. Because if we do, we get a 0 over 0 indeterminate form. In fact, it appears that the limit doesn't exist as x, y goes to 0, 0. Since it appears that the z values are increasing without bound, heading towards infinity, as we approach 0, 0 from this direction, and decreasing without bound, heading towards negative infinity, as we approach 0, 0 from that direction. We can work this out mathematically. First, let's approach 0, 0 on the x-axis from the positive x values. That means we're going to be approaching along points of the form t0, where t is bigger than 0 and t is approaching 0. In this case, we're taking the limit as t goes to 0 of t over t squared plus 0 squared. So that's the limit as t goes to 0. It's from the positive side, since we're assuming t is bigger than 0, of t over t squared. That's the limit of 1 over t. And that's going to be heading towards positive infinity, since we're getting numbers that are larger and larger in magnitude and positive in sign, since t is positive. Similarly, if we approach 0, 0 on the x-axis from the negative x values, then we'll be approaching along points of the form t0, where t is less than 0 and heading towards 0. In this case, the limit is going to be the limit as t goes to 0 from the minus side of t over t squared plus 0 squared, which is the limit as t goes to 0 from the minus side of 1 over t, which is negative infinity, since those fractions are always going to be negative. So we can see that the limit does not exist, just like we predicted from the graph. In this last example, it looks from the picture like the limit as x, y goes to 0, 0 of our function might exist because everything seems to be settling down in green territory as we head towards 0 from any direction. We can build up some evidence that the limit exists by approaching along different paths. For example, 
we might want to approach along the x-axis. That'll be points of the form t0 as t goes to 0, and we can evaluate that limit and get 0. Similarly, if we approach along the y-axis, points of the form 0t, we also get a limit of 0. If we approach along the line y equals x, that's points of the form tt, we still get a limit of 0. So we're building up a little evidence that the limit might be 0, but this is nowhere near a proof since we haven't approached along all possible paths, and in fact we can't approach along all possible paths since there are infinitely many of them and they could wiggle around and do all crazy sorts of stuff before getting to the point zero, 0. One trick for justifying that the limit is 0 is turning this problem into a co problem in polar coordinates. So if we set x equal to r cosine theta and y equal to r sine theta, then looking at the limit as x, y goes to 0, 0 is equivalent to looking at the limit as r goes to 0 of r cosine theta cubed over r cosine theta squared plus r sine theta squared. We can simplify this a little. And since cosine squared plus sine squared is 1 and some of the r's cancel, we can simplify this further to the limit as r goes to 0 of r cosine cubed theta. Now this is looking promising. Cosine is bounded between negative 1 and 1, so cosine cubed is also bounded between negative 1 and 1. Therefore, as r goes to 0, this whole quantity is going to have to go to 0. More formally, we can apply the squeeze theorem. We have the inequality cosine cubed theta is between 1 and negative 1 implies that negative r is less than or equal to r cosine cubed theta is less than or equal to r. Since the limit as r goes to 0 of negative r is 0 and the limit as r goes to 0 of r equals 0, by the squeeze theorem, the limit as r goes to 0 of the function in between also has to be 0. Therefore, our limit is 0. In this video, we worked out a few examples where limits did and did not exist for functions of several variables. The main trick that we used to show that limits do not exist was to find two different paths for which we get different limits. This is analogous to the Calculus 1 example where we might have limits that are different values when we approach from different sides. It's just now we have many different paths by which we can approach a single point. It can be a little trickier to show that limits do exist, since it's not possible to approach from every single path. Instead, the techniques we used were to use the limit laws or the continuity of the function and just plug in values. Another approach is to use polar coordinates which can reduce the problem to a calculus one kind of problem where we just have one variable r heading towards zero instead of two.